Mark 6, 35-46 And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Of all our Lord Jesus Christ's miracles, none is so frequently described in the Gospels as that which we have now read. Each of the four evangelists was inspired to record it. It is evident that it demands a more than ordinary attention from every reader of God's word. Let us observe for one thing in this passage what an example this miracle affords of our Lord Jesus Christ's almighty power. We are told that he fed five thousand men with five loaves and two fish. We are distinctly told that this multitude had nothing to eat. We are no less distinctly told that the whole provision for their sustenance consisted of only five loaves and two fish. And yet we read that our Lord took these loaves and fish, blessed, broke, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And the conclusion of the narrative tells us that they ate and were filled, and that twelve baskets full of fragments were taken up. Here was creative power beyond all question. Something real, solid, substantial, must manifestly have been called into being, which did not before exist. There is no room left for the theory that the people were under the influence of an optical delusion or a heated imagination. Five thousand hungry people would never have been satisfied if they had not received into their mouths material bread. Twelve baskets full of fragments would never have been taken up if the five loaves had not been miraculously multiplied. In short, it is plain that the hand of him who made the world out of nothing 
was present on this occasion. None but he who at first created all things and sent down manna in the desert could thus have spread a table in the wilderness. It becomes all true Christians to store up facts like these in their minds and to remember them in time of need. We live in the midst of an evil world and see few with us and many against us. We carry within us a weak heart, too ready at any moment to turn aside from the right way. We have near us at every moment a busy devil, watching continually for our halting and seeking to lead us into temptation. Where shall we turn for comfort? What shall keep faith alive and preserve us from sinking in despair? There is only one answer. We must look to Jesus. We must think on his almighty power and his wonders of old time. We must call to mind how he can create food for his people out of nothing and supply the needs of those who follow him even in the wilderness. And as we think these thoughts, we must remember that this Jesus still lives, never changes, and is on our side. Let us observe for another thing in this passage our Lord Jesus Christ's conduct when the miracle of feeding the multitude had been performed. We read that when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. There is something deeply instructive in this circumstance. Our Lord never sought the praise of man. After one of his greatest miracles, we find him immediately seeking solitude and spending his time in prayer. He practiced what he had taught elsewhere when he said, Enter into your closet and shut your door, and pray to your father which is in secret. None ever did such mighty works as he did. None ever spoke such words. None ever was so constant in prayer. Let our Lord's conduct in this respect be our example. We cannot work miracles as he did. In this he stands alone. But we can walk in his steps in the matter of private devotion. If we have the spirit of adoption, we can pray. Let us resolve to pray more than we have done hitherto. Let us strive to make time and place and opportunity for being alone with God. Above all, let us not only pray before we attempt to work for God, but pray also after our work is done. It would be well for us all if we examined ourselves more frequently as to our habits about private prayer. What time do we give to it in the 24 hours of the day? What progress can we mark one year with another in the fervency, fullness and earnestness of our prayers? What do we know by experience of laboring fervently in prayer? Colossians 4.12 These are humbling inquiries but they are useful for our souls. There are few things, it may be feared, in which Christians come so far short of Christ's example as they do in the matter of prayer. Our master's strong crying and tears, his continuing all night in prayer to God, his frequent withdrawal, to private places, 
to hold close communion with the Father are things more talked of and admired than imitated. We live in an age of hurry, bustle, and so-called activity. Men are tempted continually to cut short their private devotions and abridge their prayers. When this is the case, we need not wonder that the Church of Christ does little in proportion to its machinery. The Church must learn to copy its head more closely. Its members must be more in their closets. We have little because little is asked. James 4, 2.